So please welcome Mark Piper. Okay, folks. Are you guys morning people? Yes. Yeah. Right. yes. Good, good, good. Because I'm actually not a morning person, but I pretend every day. <laughs> so uh, let's get this going. We don't have a clicker, so I'll just give you that sign when it's time to rock and roll. I am so honored to be here speaking with the best of Procter & Gamble, and I'll give you some very practical things. Feel free to talk to me. I don't know if you went to a Baptist church. I did. You know how the preacher talked to you? You yell back to him. Feel free to do that. Uh, let's go ahead and get rocking and rolling. So we, we have about 25 minutes here. We'll make them meaningful. Uh, not a ton of time, but I'll try to give you some practical steps, and I will give out my business card, so feel free to follow up with any questions you might have. Um, so the number one thing is I'll be very brief on what my background is, what Fletch does, how I came up with the idea. I'll take a little more time to talk about emerging technologies. Not necessarily the technologies of the day after tomorrow that have yet to come to fruition, like driverless cars, which is interesting, but won't be around in the mass market for a while. We'll talk about technologies that are here today and will be very big tomorrow. And then also I'll talk about PNG entrepreneurship. How do you operate as an entrepreneur within PNG looking for opportunities to create innovation? Do those sound like good things to talk about? Yes. Yes. Good, because that's what's on the menu anyway. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, we be out of luck. So let's carry on from here. So what I do is I run a company called Fletch. Fletch does effortless time and attendance. We do it for universities and we do it for enterprise clients. What that means is if this was a 400 student lecture hall, my technology would detect the presence of your phones and automatically take attendance. For businesses, it does the same thing, but it generates timesheets automatically without anyone looking at favor. So that's what we do. You can imagine employers like that because they get to pay hours accurately. <laughs> so that's what Fletch does. Now the question is, you know, how did I come up with this innovation? I'll be very brief. I have a really cool story, but I won't share that right now. What I will say is, at the end of the day, this was designed for higher education to help ensure that students are graduating because 50% of America's college students drop out. You can imagine that African Americans and students of color are disproportionately represented in the dropout population. That's what we wanted to address. I created the wrong product initially, talked to many customers, and through that customer discovery process, that's how we figured out that attendance was one of the leading factors in students graduating. So that's the short and sweet of how we came up with that innovation. Carry on. And feel free to raise your hand and ask questions. My first job was as a teacher, so I'm all about it. <laughs> Tomorrow's innovations. There are three big ones that exist today and will be much bigger tomorrow. The first one you see at the bottom, what is that one? Talk to virtual, me. Reality. Virtual, reality. Yeah. virtual reality. So virtual reality is pretty big today. It's going to be much bigger tomorrow. Primarily it's waiting on the consumer to get the Oculus for more of these hardware devices to be in the hands of consumers. Today we're seeing that VR is most deployed in the gaming industry. We're going to see that it's going to grow next in terms of remote collaboration. Software companies like Immerse, which is actually a Cincinnati-based company that allows you to communicate virtually with your team. So you now have a portable workplace that allows you to communicate up to eight hours comfortably, particularly for technical employees. So we're going to see VR come into gaming more, into remote collaboration, and then of course the adult industry is going to be the one that will make it a little bit more tactile and really run with it. Next, with that big B, what is that one? The Bitcoin. You guys are technical. They said you were the IT folks. Okay. <laughs> so obviously, not necessarily Bitcoin, we're talking about the underlying blockchain technology with cryptocurrency. We're going to see that financial tech is going to see huge revolution, which is going to displace some banks that are not adapting quickly. Other times we're going to see banks are adapting the blockchain technology. For example, Western Union is adopting XRP and Ripple. And so essentially, as you all know, I know some folks, we met a gentleman from Senegal, we're going to see that money is going to be able to travel across borders very quickly within seconds at greater efficiency 
very low cost for the consumer. It'll travel across borders without anyone needing a bank as an intermediary. It'll go person to person. That's in the future. We're seeing a lot of people getting behind this. We see the Venezuelan government has created their own cryptocurrency. So this is something that's inevitable and will radically change the way business is done. It'll even change perhaps the way companies like Procter & Gamble collect money direct from the consumer. So that is going to be a huge one. It's the internet of money, right? It's a revolution as big as the internet. And that last one might be a little harder to get. Which one is that? Medical records. Yeah. Telemedicine. That's underlying it. Medical records and virtual doctors. Virtual doctors, telemedicine. So everything included in telemedicine, which will be making sure that your records are portable. What's the big change here? For a long time, we've had primary care physicians. Why do you need a primary care physician? Because they need to be familiar with you, right? And now that your records will be digital and you can take them with you from doctor to doctor, primary care physicians will be less relevant in the future. Telemedicine will allow you to get diagnoses before you can leave the house. And so that'll be a really big one. And companies like Procter & Gamble will leverage things like telemedicine. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So PNG, let's think about how we can talk intrapreneurship. So I want to tell you some things that you're not going to see on Google. You can Google types of innovation, how do I innovate, how do I be an entrepreneur. I want to talk about three things you probably will not see on there. So number one, if you want to create some innovation, particularly with the type of product line that we're seeing here within the Procter & Gamble brands and products, you need to create or dominate a platform. I'll give you a little bit more elaboration on what I mean by that. Secondly, typically we see that companies are selling data. We need to get beyond selling data. What we really want to do is offer data for free. At Fletcher, we use an inclusive data model. I'll tell you more about what that means. We want to use the data to make the sale. The data itself is not the sale. We want to use it to leverage the sale. And the last thing is regulation. Generally, people think that regulation limits innovation. You have to figure out how you get on the correct side of regulation to use it to actually drive innovation, to anticipate which regulations are coming down the pipeline so you can adjust in advance and destroy your competition. And I'll give a brief case study on how that's happening. There's a major regulation that just recently came out in Europe, which is affecting the whole world, which, anyone know that one? GDPR. GDPR. You guys are good. All right, we can give some A's out in this class. <laughs> So the first thing I said is to create or dominate the platform. What's WebMD? Anyone heard of WebMD or yes. used it? Raise your hand and talk to me. Who, who has it? It's where you go to find out you're about to die. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're a man, too. Like, if you're not going to go to the doctor, you're like, let me Google this real quick. Okay. <laughs> So what we mean by create or dominate the platform is, we are like, oh man, I think I got the flu, but I'm not sure. Google, you know, what happens when you get the flu? What should you do? The first hit that comes up is one with WebMD. Now, the reason people trust WebMD is because they get out great content that's reliable and curated by actual physicians. But what WebMD does not do is give you product recommendations. If you have the flu, you're going to need to take some sort of pharmaceutical, correct? Now, if you're Procter & Gamble, that would make me wonder, why is it that you don't own or run WebMD itself or a platform similar to WebMD so that when the person is looking to read up on what to do about the flu, you can say, hey, here are the three steps you should take to eradicate this flu or prevent flu. And hey, we actually have a product for flu, which is called... I don't work for PNG. That's you. <laughs> Talk to me. What do we say? VIX. That's right, VIX. VIX. All of that, right? And so what happens when you own that platform, it allows you to make the first recommendation to the consumer before your competitors. And it's a higher level. It's not advertising. At this point, it's recommendation. And that's what you need to do in terms of owning or dominating the platform. There are other platforms that you can't own because they already exist. Platforms like YouTube. But you'll see a lot of how-to videos on YouTube. So if you're a makeup company, it would be wise to dominate all the how-to tutorials on putting on certain types of makeup. So that's what we mean by create or dominate the platform for your particular vertical. 
Now, inclusive data is really important. Anyone ever heard this term, inclusive data? Probably not, because we created this one at Fletch. So remember where you got this. Oh, <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> um, inclusive data is really important. Today, what we've had in terms of the news has been the controversy around Facebook taking data on you, not telling you what the data points are not sharing the data points with you, and in some cases, selling the data to companies so that they can target adverts at you. And now we see that the regulation has come out in Europe which, uh, which says no more. Now what we did at Fletch is we said, well, how can we take the data, share the data with you the whole way through, and then use the data to drive your consumption? So here's an example of an app, actually, for parents which I'm not a parent, uh, as far as I know. Dory <laughs> <laughs> hasn't given me a call or anything like that. And what it does is it keeps your metrics on your child. Breastfeeding and all these different things, but most importantly, the diapers, uh, defecation, urination, all these different things. And so if you have an app like this and you own the app at Procter & Gamble, what you're able to do is to give some analytics and say, hey, you're going to need to buy some more Pampers or some more Loves in this amount of time. Click here to order. Or you can set it for automatic order. And they can see why they need it because you're sharing the data with them the whole way through. So it less seems that you're selling something or giving them an advertisement. And it's more so like, hey, we got this data. We know your child defecates at this rate and consumes Pampers at this rate. We want to help you out and make sure that you're fully prepared. And so now you're positioning yourself from a product standpoint as someone that's helping rather than selling. Does that make sense? Okay, carry on here. Here's the big thing for us that I think is going to lead the way in terms of innovation. Innovation doesn't always have to be something crazy, like you have to be Elon Musk, we're gonna to fly to Mars, we're gonna create a time machine. Sometimes you innovate in terms of business model, who you're selling to, the price point you're selling at, whether you're selling something, you haven't innovated at all, you just made it look nicer. On the cosmetic side, for example, with my company, we use a Bluetooth device. This is the most expensive Bluetooth device on the market. The irony is that it, it's no better than any of the other devices. Literally, the only reason we buy it is because it looks cool. It looks a lot cooler than the other devices. That itself is an innovation if you can get someone to buy because of that. So what I want to talk about is how we can leverage data to drive profit and innovation. We already talked about this regulation, which is a European regulation, but since all of the major international companies, multinational companies are already enacting it, it is a worldwide uh, regulation. You're really good with those slides, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> So, so it has these major points, which we'll go through briefly, and I know that you all are probably very familiar with them. Consent, meaning that the person has to opt in, which is great, because I'm tired of ending up on mailing lists I didn't ask to be on. Uh, breach notification, if your data has been breached, you must notify the end user within a certain amount of time, which is critical. Right to access, meaning that you can see your own information that's being collected. Right to be forgotten, you can remove yourself. Data portability kind of some of the things we talked about with that telemedicine, which is you can take your data with you, you can export it. Uh, privacy by design, this one is hugely important. I mean, you are designing the innovation up front to respect privacy. That is a core feature of your technology. And then the last one's less important, we'll carry on. We're not ahead of time right now. Here's the important part that we're looking at is right to access. And this is a, a really important thing, a free electronic copy of your data, which means essentially that you can no longer charge for data, right? I said, we've already been charging for the data has been what we're selling. At Fletch, we decided a long time ago that we're not selling the data, we're giving the data and we're using that to drive the sale of something else. And so this is the important part. And I'll give you a, a brief case study on a company that's in our space that is currently selling data which is bad for them because this regulation is going to stop them from expanding into new markets and eventually it will stop them from operating in this existing market. And that's the innovation, is being ahead of these regulations. So this other company is called Arcave. I, I usually don't even like to say their name, but you know, I'll just say it for the, for the sake of this. We'll carry on here. 
So this is how our cave works, and it, it already starts off rough. So the first thing they do is you download the app and you enable location. GPS, what's the first issue there? First potential issue? Just tracking batteries. Sure. Sure. Right. And that knows where you are all the time. Thank you. It knows where you are all the time. It knows when you're at work, knows when you're at your home, knows when you went to go visit your girlfriend, knows when you went to the babysitter, and that's the first problem. It knows where you are all the time, even though it's not relevant to the technology. Because if it's only seeking to take attendance at a classroom or take timesheets for an employer, why does it need to know when you went to the club, right? So that's problem number one. Problem number two that you'll see is you have to actually check into your class or wherever you're at. You have to pull out your phone and manually check in. So we'll carry on. What we did, which is different, is we said, we'll use this device here, which we just peel off the adhesive, pop it on the wall, we can leave it there for three years, no maintenance, no one needs to know this device is there. It uses long range Bluetooth. So when your phone comes into range of this device, it knows that you're within this room called, I don't even know what this room is called. 12th floor. 12th floor, <laughs> you, got, you got a team over here. It knows you're on the 12th floor, so it reports your location as the 12th floor and updates it in real time. But the great thing is once you leave this proximity, it doesn't know where you are. So it's in complete respect of your privacy, which means that those regulations will never stop us from operating in Europe, which we do operate in Italy. Further, it allows us to leverage on the marketing side from the very get-go and say, hey, value, a value for this company has always been privacy. We don't know where you are when you leave out of range of this device. Carry on. And so it's the whole thing about charging for data versus leveraging free data to drive consumption. I can't emphasize that enough. And then here's the other thing. Another big piece of that regulation is that you don't really want to hold sensitive information. Why is it you don't want to hold sensitive information? That's right, you can be breached, that's right. Confucius said, if you're not wearing a nice diamond chain, no one's going to want to steal a nice diamond chain. Confucius or Tupac said it. <laughs> so, if you don't hold any sensitive information, you will not have breaches. We all know if a breach occurs and your company reports out that, hey, your credit card information has been stolen, number one, you've lost consumer trust. Number two, you've put yourself in a position for lawsuits, right? It's all that. So we are able to do this without any sensitive information like location. I'll give you an example of one of the problems with location-based technologies. Anyone in here a runner use a running app? Which running app might you use? I hate Nike. The Nike one? Mm -hmm. I use the, the Under Armour one called Map My Run. They all kind of do the same thing. You have people who are deployed in the Middle East, in a particular country, using Map My Run. That is doing their three miles. And then you have people who had hacked the data to that app and found out where these people were and where the military base was based on those routes. Isn't that crazy? So now you see the importance of not holding sensitive data. And so we're able to achieve the same thing that Archive is able to achieve without holding any sensitive data like the location or any other personally identifiable information, which gives us a great advantage and is in itself an innovation. So what you'll see is this is how they sell, sell data. It's kind of wild in that they charge the student to actually view their own attendance record. Which sounds confusing because the student is giving them consent to collect the record, but they won't let them see the record without them paying a dollar every month. Carry on. And what's ironic is if the record doesn't go through, the student wouldn't know, so they have to go ahead and check with the instructor and bother them to make sure that the record's actually collected. Carry on. So what we've tried to do the whole way through is to drive innovation while respecting the regulation, but we anticipated what was coming down the pipeline. And so that's the, the great recommendation there. So number one, we made ourselves effortless. And number two, we made it data inclusive, which we're one of the first companies to use that model in terms of making sure that the user has the data the whole way through. We're leveraging that to drive consumption. Then what we do on the back end is this. Once we get all of this data together, we'll put it together in a report, and we're able to come to the institution, whether it's an employer or a college, and we say, hey, our data has indicated that students who attend less than 70% of credit hours have a two and three chance of either failing or dropping out. 
So now we know that if they go below 70% of uh, credit hours attended, there's gonna be a problem. Then what does the college say? Now what does the college need to do? What need do we create? Raise your hand, feel free to speak up. It's still a free country. <laughs> <laughs> this is my change, so to speak up today. Get them to come to class. Yeah, get them to come to class, but we know exactly how much class they need to attend to be successful. They need to attend at least 70% of their credit hours. So now the college needs a way to do what? To monitor the ongoing credit hours. So we gave them the data free, and now we've created a need where they need a tool to monitor the, the credit hours on an ongoing basis. And that's how we lock them in to the business model, which is much different than selling them this and then telling them, well, I don't know what to do. I just sold you the data. Do what you do, which is a model that's been failing. We just talked to the University of Cincinnati yesterday, and they, they've bought a bunch of data from a company, but the company didn't tell them what to do. The problem in our era is something called big data. You heard of big data? What does it mean? A whole bunch of information, right? Tomorrow is about critical data, meaning meaningful data points that are very narrow in scope in which you can prescribe specific actions that lead to an outcome. Critical data. So, wrap this baby up. Do you understand what flesh does? Yeah. Fantastic. You familiar with three important emerging technologies that will be in mass market within the near future. What are they? Give me one. Well, that's virtual uh, physician. Cryptocurrency. cryptocurrency. Telemedicine, medicine, virtual. cryptocurrency, yeah. blockchain, and the virtual, virtual, reality. virtual reality. reality. Excellent. Do you have some new perspective on how you can engage in uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship by creating complementary products, platforms that allow you to increase the sale of existing PNG products like, for example, I don't know, VIX and things like that. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. All right, so it looks like we've achieved our goals, folks. Thank you. I appreciate you giving me the time to talk to you. I'll pop up my contact info if you need a deeper dive on anything. You have a question? Me, I was, I was, I was hoping you were just going to tell us a little bit more about pleasure. Oh, sure, sure. I, mean, I think we have time if you want to tell us a like, <laughs> version of the funny story, because I feel like we all were waiting for it. We're okay, curious now. Okay. We want to know. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah. Well, I'll give you the kind of the longer story of the evolution of Fletch. So uh, to start with, uh, I grew up in Los Angeles uh, in poverty, and I think we know historically you, you kind of become what your parents are um, in terms of profession. And what made America unique was that we have an educational system whereby you don't have to be what your parents were. And so for me, what were my parents? Uh, I was born, my mother was on crack cocaine in Los Angeles, and my father was in prison doing 10 years for selling crack cocaine. And so you don't think America is a land of opportunity when you grow up in a situation like that. I had the good fortune to wiggle my way into university, and so I got into Berkeley. And then when I came out of Berkeley, I found like, oh man, America's not so bad. This is the land of opportunity. Uh, but the trick is that it's only the land of opportunity if you have a university education. The Lumina Foundation points out that still, even today, college is the surest way out of poverty. Those who graduate with a college degree will make a million dollars more over a lifetime than those who don't. So at that point, I said my mission is to make sure that students get into university, particularly students that look like me. So my first goal was to join Teach for America, get high school students in university. So I did Teach for America in Baltimore, Maryland. Anybody been to Baltimore? Mm -hmm. Rough town, rough town. Um, but also a beautiful town. It, people don't know, Baltimore actually has the highest number of uh, advanced degrees per capita because of all those medical professionals. But the people who are left out are mostly the African American natives who have been there since long time. And so I was there. Uh, mainly teaching black kids in schools that hadn't seen any level of integration. It's like Martin Luther King never touched down, 100% black population, tremendous fail rates. I got all these kids into college, and guess what happened? Dropped out. They all dropped out. And I was shocked, because I knew these kids were smart, because I was their teacher. I observed who they are. I mean, I didn't make them smart, but I'm saying I observed them. <laughs> I didn't make them smart, I observed that they were smart. And so from then I said, okay, you know, I, I did part one of my mission, which is get students into college. Part two is to keep them in college and get them through college. So then I ended up running a nonprofit at Johns Hopkins Medical. Uh, we got 
tons of money. Bloomberg came down, wrote a multi-million dollar check, had all the money in the world, had 200 medical professionals giving 10 to one services, 10 of them to one student. We're talking about everything, therapist, physician, academic tutoring, rides to school, financial aid counseling, everything you could possibly think of. But it didn't really fit because when you're 18, you're just getting into university out of your parents' house, what do you want? Freedom. 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 Right? They thought they were found the North Star, right? And so what I needed to create was something that was number one, scalable, because I got a million dollars from Bloomberg to run my program, but is that going to be scalable across the country for students across the country? Of course not. Number two, demographically speaking, the 18-year-old kid, 19-year-old kid wants freedom. They don't want 10 adults hovering around them. And number three, I had to ask myself, is this generation appropriate? Like, what's the future for this generation? Obviously, it's technology comes in the form of apps. So we created version one of Fletch, which was a technology that targeted support services based on demographics, so an automated thing. So for example, if you had the Fletch app and you were at the University of Cincinnati as a freshman, uh, what'd you study? Stay in. What did you study? What is it? Not natural resources. You studied natural resources, okay. So if you were African American male studying natural resources, you might get a push notification saying, hey, here's a scholarship for African American students. Tomorrow you might get a push notification saying, hey, for the natural resources class you're taking, there's tutoring tomorrow at 4 p.m. in this particular room. So it's giving you highly targeted information based on your demographic that supports you financially, pushes you to go to advising, and tells you which tutoring sessions are related to your course offering. But we weren't able to sell that to colleges. It might seem like they would care about those things, but it turned out they didn't because we're talking about regulation earlier. I mean, colleges are these big institutions that primarily move based on are they being punished really badly? What we heard that they were interested in was attendance. And the reason they were interested in attendance is because federal financial aid legally requires every college to take attendance. If you don't take attendance, they'll tell you to give the money back. So imagine the University of Cincinnati, that many millions that they give out in attendance, if they don't validate the records, literally federal financial aid will make them pay million dollar fines. So what you find out in innovation is you don't want to create a vitamin that will make someone stronger because people don't really, you know, companies or these institutions don't really care to be a little bit better. <laughs> you need to create a painkiller, right? <laughs> you have to create the painkiller that is going to attack something that is a major problem. And so we found that, yes, the attendance does validate the Title IV requirement of federal financial aid, so we provide that to them. But also, attendance is the very first indicator that a student is likely to drop out. And so we're still able to achieve our mission of supporting student success while also being able to provide the compliance records that federal financial aid asks for from these colleges. And then we are also moving into the enterprise side of things, doing the timesheets because it's just a much bigger market. It allows us to be a billion dollar company. And as you guys know, schools move slowly. Procter & Gamble can move a lot more quickly and they have a little more liquidity. So if you guys happen to know somebody at Procter & Gamble, <laughs> share the evangel. But that's essentially Fletch and uh, that's how we got going on that one. Yes, um, yeah, that question. So um, before you pulled out the Bluetooth, right? Yes. So does that mean for every class they have to have that Bluetooth sitting in their class? So you said it was expensive. So if no, I'm it's thinking, inexpensive. It's inexpensive. inexpensive. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, but still, so does that mean every class has to have this in their class? So if, yep. if, if it does. That's, that's correct. So for example, uh, this device, we charge the university about $40 per, and we leave it on the wall. And the great thing is that you have about five or six classes that will operate within any given classroom. So one device in a given classroom at a large institution will see about 1,500 students per week. Mm -hmm. So at the most, at University of Cincinnati, we look at putting in 209 devices. They got about 40,000 students over, them, over there. So it's a very, very good buy for them. Mm -hmm. And it lasts for three years, remember, too. So it's just the $40 the first time. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the cheaper technologies that they'll ever put in. Mm -hmm. How do you Sorry, what do you do for the students that don't have cell phones? We need to find some. We need to find some students who don't have cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. And, and we actually always get that question. So 
We used to have the company headquartered in Puerto Rico, and if Puerto Rico was a state, it'd be Port of the Mississippi, the poorest state in the union. And even in Puerto Rico, every student had a cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, we have had one situation in uh, Virginia where there was an older student that had a feature phone, a flip phone, and we just bought them a phone because it was it was easier to do. <laughs> oh, one of you, you take mine. <laughs> but um, so. And like, for example, you know, just a couple months ago, I was in uh, Addis Ababa, and you find even uh, in retrograde economies, uh, cell phone penetration is still relatively high. So um, when I speak with entrepreneurs, a lot of times they don't, and they start technology companies, they aren't necessarily technologists by trade. Right. What is the skill set that you're seeing, or the characteristics that you're seeing that make great entrepreneurs? That's it. I agree with you. That was a fine question. <laughs> <laughs> question quality in here is high. So, I think the number one thing is that you are resourceful. And I've heard it said that you never lose something because of lack of resources. You lose because of lack of resourcefulness. And so, you're right. I wasn't a, a technologist. I actually started in political science at Berkeley. Uh, because at the time when I was young and I didn't know anything, I thought that the government helped people. And so <laughs> I was going to go into politics because I thought the government helped people. And I actually did go into politics in Baltimore. I uh, worked for the mayor there. And uh, I, that's when I realized, man, the government ain't helping nobody. You gotta fight for yourself. <laughs> but, um, uh, I, I kind of went into business as a refuge, knowing that if you run a social impact company, you can do great things. So for example, you can see uh, Mother Teresa who will go and feed people, maybe she's fed 100,000 people. And then you'll see Bill Gates uh, can feed three million people and, and still not be half as nice as Mother Teresa, right? And so that was one of my driving forces is that uh, conscious capitalism has a huge impact, especially if you have a double bottom line. Um, the second thing was when you have an idea that you feel like, if I don't do it, who's going to do it? I was called to do this. And I think that's the important thing is that you feel like you were called to do it. You wake up and you think, man, I really gotta get going because you wake up every day without a boss to tell you, hey, did you clock in on time? Did you clock out on time? Hey, do you know what you're doing? Do you have your plan? And you're driving this whole process. So you have to have tremendous passion. Obviously, I'm on the business side of things, so you have to bring a team around you. And so I think that's also, it must be a person who's good at getting people to join in on a mission. The one who says, hey, this is what the course is. This is why we're going this way. Do you want to join me? And I'm not trying to get religious in here, but I remember Jesus said something that I thought was crazy. Um, he told someone, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but I have not even a place to lay my head. Leave everything you have and follow me. Which I think is a tremendous feat of leadership to basically say, you got the Rolls Royce, you got the Bentley, leave everything you have and follow me. I'm the one, I have the goods. And I feel like as an entrepreneur, you're basically doing that, right? Because say I need someone to build my product, the technologist. What does it look like for me to come to you and say, you work for a Fortune 500 company, I need you to be my chief technologist. How much you making? You making 100,000? How about you make nothing for the first year and a half and we're just gonna figure it out. <laughs> um, Right? <laughs> but that's a crazy story to tell somebody. And so I think you're in a similar position in that you're using your word, you're, you're using your integrity, you have that tremendous resourcefulness, you have to convince this person, like, I got the juice, like, I can't give you a salary now, but I bet you next year we can get you one, and they have to come along for that ride and believe you. So I, I think those are kind of the chief traits. All right, everybody, would you please give Marquette another round? token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your um, company and your knowledge with us. And once again, everybody, let's show Marquette some love. And if you've got questions, comments, anything you want to share and know, we've got his info up here. And if you don't have it now, see someone from BCM Planning to get it uh, at the end of the day. All right. Thank you so much.